This is uh, more of a, a lecture than, than anything else, and that means uh, hopefully you get a deep seat in the saddle, maybe you have a piece of paper or something to take some notes on. Um, I've skipped a couple of the things, uh, some of the background issues, so we can really get into the, the heart of the matter, because I'm assuming most of you uh, were able to be here for the, uh, uh, the weekend, and so you've already had at least some of an introduction as to why this is important. Uh, but let me just uh, say a few things along those lines and, and then dive right into the material. I honestly believe that what we're dealing with this morning is the fundamental apologetic issue in our day. Because no matter what apologetic subject we're addressing, Christian worldview issues, homosexuality, marriage, uh, ethics, uh, the existence of God, atheism, um, uh, and any of the religious uh, issues, it all comes back to whether we know what God has provided to us, whether there's been a revelation from God. Uh, certainly that's somewhat of a, of a theological, philosophical argument in regards to whether God has revealed himself or not. But when it comes down to the issue of how has he revealed himself, in what way has he revealed himself, then the question becomes, can we know that what we possess today is what God gave to the apostles of Jesus or to Isaiah or to whoever else it might be. And so I see Bibles all over the place here. And uh, some of you may have your Bibles on a computer, on a handheld device. You may have the paper edition, whatever it might be. We have Bibles. Whichever one it is, uh, even if you're holding the paper edition, hopefully you realize that, that that's not how it came to us. Uh, the Bible did not come in a leather, uh, leather cover with thumb indexing and, and silver edges on the page and so on and so forth. There was a process, a very lengthy process, whereby uh, these books came to us. Most of the attacks today are upon the reliability of the text of the New Testament. I'm not even going to be touching on the Old Testament, the Old Testament subject. Honestly, I don't think it could even begin to be addressed in any less than three hours uh, because you're talking about one of the most ancient works of antiquity. Um, uh, it, is, it is a completely different area, but most of the attacks are aimed at the New Testament itself. Uh, just in, in passing, I might, might mention, uh, you're going to see this. Uh, keep this little thing here in mind. That's what I was trying to get you both sides of that, and for some reason my computer just would not uh, import a, a graphic. I don't know why. Uh, it just refused to do it. But... Um, uh, that little manuscript right there will actually be the basis of the morning sermon. So uh, just take a look at it, sort of burn it into your memory. We're going to see it again a little bit later on. Uh, but that's actually going to be the basis of, uh, of our sermon uh, this morning and what it particularly says. Now, let's start off. Um, uh, anybody have uh, like an ESV or NASB or something uh, Okay, could you uh, read for me, please, uh, John chapter 5, verse 4. Go ahead and look it up in, in yours if you need to click over to it, tap over to it, whatever. Uh, read me the Gospel of John chapter 5, verse 4 for me. He's even standing up for us. This is very nice. This is very nice. Gospel of John chapter 5, verse 4. And there we stood. Don't worry, brother. No one else can find it either. There is no John chapter 5, verse 4. There's a 5-3, and there's a 5-5, but there is no John chapter 5, verse 4. Now, honestly, how many of you knew that before I did that to you? Okay. Um, how many of you will honestly say, just go ahead and be honest, that bugs me. Okay, good. Now, if you are looking, you're probably looking down at the bottom of the page going, okay, there's got to be a note here. And there is. The ESV has a text note. The NESB has a text note. It's in that little teeny, tiny, 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 tiny font that I can't read anymore. It just looks like smudges at the bottom of the page. Uh, you young folks, you can see it. Enjoy your youth and your hair. Uh, and um, uh, so, but it goes from 5.3 to 5.5. Five. Now, it's not like uh, we don't know why this is. Uh, in fact, uh, if, if you want, here's, here's all the information you could ever want to know about John chapter 5, verse 4. Helpful to anybody? Uh, maybe if you're a seminary student or something like that, that uh, gives you, believe it or not, that does give you all the information that you do need to know about this particular text. But 
most of you are sitting there going, that doesn't help me out a whole lot. Maybe by the end of this time period, it will. Uh, we will talk about where John 5, 4 went. You can see the Greek text here goes from 5, 3 to 5, 5. Um, and uh, you, you might go, well, uh, that, that really, really bothers me. Well, we'll actually sort of decipher a bunch of this here for you a little bit later on so you can see uh, exactly what's going on in this particular text. But you can see how easy it would be for someone like a Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is the leading critic of New Testament uh, Christianity in the English-speaking world today. He is an apostate. That is not an insult. That's an observation, and it's a fact. He's a graduate of Moody Bible Institute, Wheaton College, and Princeton Theological Seminary, uh, but he no longer claims to be a Christian. And when the world wants somebody to go to to have an argument against the New Testament, they all go to Bart Ehrman, who is happy to provide them with those arguments because he's writing books right and left and making lots of money uh, attacking uh, New Testament Christianity. His books then become used as textbooks throughout universities, uh, college campuses all across the United States. And uh, then he ends up with little minions, uh, like uh, the man that my daughter ran into her first semester at uh, Glendale Community College, a vile anti-Christian bigot. And I do mean vile. Uh, I had her record his lectures that were filled with profanity, which they f- defended as, uh, as academic freedom and, uh, and the like. Uh, and uh, so you know, our our young people go off to university, get an advanced degree. What do you run into? You run into people like this who will very quickly point to you uh, texts like John chapter 5, verse 4, or to the two longest uh, textual variants in the New Testament, the longer ending of Mark, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, 12 verses long, and the other long textual variant, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the comma Johannium, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, Pericope adultery, the uh, story of the woman taken in adultery, Uh, The story that uh, Dan Wallace, uh, professor at Dallas Seminary, describes as his favorite Bible story that's not actually in the Bible. Uh, You may remember that uh, Mel Gibson, even in a movie on the Passion, managed to find a way to stick the story of the woman taking adultery into uh, into his movie because, well, you just can't make a movie about Jesus without that particular story. Uh, The problem is uh, it's not original to the Gospel of John. We'll probably have an opportunity to take a look at that a little bit later on. Now... The current onslaught is very easy to understand. Naturalistic materialism rules the day in academia. Anything that does not presuppose an uncreated universe that can be explained solely on the basis of naturalism is rejected a priori. You can't even uh, just start to discuss the issues of worldview in most of academia today. Uh, they are dogmatically naturalistic uh, to the point of ridicule of anyone else. Christian claims are relegated to the arena of myth. If you want to believe that, that's fine. Just recognize that your myths are no, lo- no better than anybody else's myths, and uh, you cannot utilize your myths to actually engage in the world around you. Scholars spin the evidence, particularly in media appearances. Uh, Bart Ehrman uh, loves being on, like, The Daily Show and things like that, and they will spin the evidence. CNN and even Fox News and people like that will be very, very quick to grab hold of these folks. They emphasize that all we have are copies of copies of copies of copies from hundreds of years after the originals. The idea being that, well, you had somebody who made one copy, and then someone makes a copy of that, then someone makes a copy of that, and this guy makes a few errors, and that guy makes a few errors, and by the time you get to the earliest manuscripts, you really can't tell what was originally there. This is the idea that is being presented. Now, the fact of the matter is uh, that the New Testament was written uh, during a period of time where we did not have photocopiers. In fact, the first photocopier was invented in 1949. Up until then, even with the advent of printing, human error is a part of the reduplication of of written texts. That's just the way it is. If I were to start with the front row up here and pass out the first two chapters of the Gospel of Mark, have you make a copy, handwritten copy, pass your copy to the person behind, and then they make a copy and pass it to the person behind. By the time we got to the back row, there would be a number of variations that would have been introduced to the text. Now, in comparing all of them in the back row, would we be, we'd be able to determine the original text? Most probably. But since most of us are not trained scribes, some, some of the errors that we made would be rather egregious and rather interesting, especially if we tried to distract you during the course of your copying of those manuscripts. 
Now, given that we have about 5,700, approximately, the number keeps changing, around 5,700 cataloged, handwritten manuscripts of the New Testament. That does not mean it's a copy from Matthew to Revelation. The older the manuscript, the more partial it's going to be. So the older manuscripts might be of just the epistles of Paul or the Gospels or a portion of the Gospels. And when you get to the really, really, really old ones, it might be a couple of verses on a piece of papyri is all that we have. The later ones tend to be much longer and much fuller. And in fact, the average New Testament manuscript in that collection is about 350 pages long. So given that amount of written material and the fact that it's all written out by hand and uh, that you did not have people, uh, they they did not invent uh, reading glasses uh, until much later in that time period, uh, did not have fluorescent lights, LASIK, or anything else like that, approximately how many variations? Now, a variation is any difference in the copying at all. So if, if someone spells John's name with two N's, that's a variant. It doesn't affect anything, but that's a variant. Uh, if uh, someone has the word and and someone doesn't have the word and, that's still a variant. How many variants do you think there might be in the New Testament? Now, let me just let you know. The, New, the Greek New Testament, the, the standard Greek New Testament in use today, has approximately 138,200 words in it. 138,200 words. That's in the New Testament. So, how many variants do you think exist in the manuscript tradition in the New Testament? I sort of brought this question up yesterday, uh, and we've gotten a lot of different answers from folks. Anybody? Want to venture a guess? Unless you've already watched me do this, and then shut up. I can tell you how, so be quiet. <laughs> Hit him if he tries to say anything, okay? I give you permission to do so. Only for this service, not after, not after that. Anyone? About a thousand. I'm sorry? Can't hear you. Hundred thousand. Half a million. Thirty thousand. Well, we've got, a, we've got a wide variety here. We've got a wide variety here. I sort of feel like uh, 30,000, that's about 44,000, 40,000, 45, 50, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of, I, I never understand what they're saying either, and I'm not really sure they do either. But uh, uh, basically, uh, if we ask the question, how many variants, uh, and we, we add them all up, there are approximately 400,000 variants. 400,000 variants. That's everything. That's every, uh, every possible misspelling of a word, everything else over approximately 2 million pages worth of text. Now, it's on that very basis then uh, that uh, people will tell us that uh, no one can have any confidence that the text they read today accurately reflects what was originally written, and uh, they will show you a graphic sort of like this, where the blue is the number of words in the New Testament, the red is the number of variations in the New Testament, and uh, it, it looks like a really bad thing. And in fact, there are people who actually think that what that means is we have about three different options for every word in the New Testament. That is not what it means at all. What I want to tell you is what they don't tell you. First of all, 99% of all variants do not impact the meaning of the text at all. Variations in spelling and word order make up the vast bulk of the variations. For example, in the English language, we are supposed to say things like, uh, we are supposed to put an N before a word that begins with a vowel. So, for example, we're not supposed to say a apple, we're supposed to say an apple. Uh, and the exact same kind of uh, uh, feature exists in the Greek language. It's called the movable new. And uh, scribes really didn't understand the movable new, mainly because they weren't pronouncing the language. They were just copying it. And so uh, many thousands of those variants are the movable new. Now, you can't translate. The, it doesn't impact the meaning. It doesn't, you can't even explain it in the English language until you explain it in Greek first. And yet these are a number of these, these variants. Uh, there's also variation in word order. Sometimes a variation in word order is relevant. Most of the time it's not. Uh, in Greek, for example, there are far more ways of saying basic sentences as far as word order goes than there is in English. In English, word order means something. We very frequently have a, a particular word order that it communicates something. But uh, that's not necessarily the case in uh, the Greek language at all. So about 99% of them simply uh, cannot be explained in the English language. Hence, 1% of 400,000 is about 4,000 meaningful textual variants out of 138,162 words. That's the Nessial on 27th. The Nessial on 28th is a little bit longer. Is about 2.9% or one meaningful variant every three pages 
but only half of these are viable. What do I mean by viable? Well, if you had a scribe who got up uh, one morning in uh, 1394, and he had a really bad day, um, and uh, the, other, the other monks had forgotten to make the coffee, and uh, he's like some of you are, a coffee addict, uh, and if some of you did not have your coffee this morning, you'd be sitting there going mm, like this, you know, and things like that. That's why I've never touched the stuff myself. Um, and uh, so the other monks didn't make the coffee, and uh, he just had a really bad night. He didn't sleep well. There was a cricket in his cell, and uh, he's just having a bad day, and his eyesight's getting worse and worse. And he gets up that morning, and he's copying a New Testament manuscript, and he introduces a reading into the text that's never, ever been seen before. Uh, none of the early church fathers knew about it. Uh, There's no manuscript before 1392 that, uh, that said this. That would not be a viable reading. There, there would be no evidence that this could actually go back to the original and be the original. So only about half of those 4,000 are viable. So there's about 1,500 to 2,000 viable, meaningful New Testament textual variants Uh, That's quite a different picture. For example, if we were to look at it graphically, now the blue is the number of words and the little teeny red bar is the number of variations uh, in in comparison to the number of words. And you'll see that it's a very, very different situation. Now, think about it. Very simple fact. The more manuscripts you have, the more textual variants you're going to have. If you only have one manuscript of the Gospel of Mark, how many textual variants will you have? None. None. And that's what most people would like, but I think most people can recognize if we only have one manuscript, what's the problem with only having one manuscript over against 500 manuscripts? You've got to trust that whoever wrote that one manuscript got it exactly right. If they made a mistake anywhere along the line, there's no way to find out. There's no way to become blinded by the projector when you're walking right in front of it like that. Whoa. Okay. We will walk behind the pulpit from now on so that we don't have all those uh, things in front of us and fall off and look really silly. Um, if, you, if you have that just one manuscript, there's no way of correcting any of the errors that one particular scribe might have made. And so the more manuscripts you have, the better. In fact, most people who work in the textual critical area outside the New Testament look at those of us who work in the area of the New Testament, and they're like, what is wrong with you people? Uh, The only reason you guys sit around and argue so much is because you have so much information in comparison to anything else of antiquity. We're going to show you a graphic of of just how much uh, that's true, how uh, true that is a little bit later on. Uh, But the reality is the more manuscripts you have, the more variants you're going to have. So just simply to to quote numbers of variants without having the background of how many manuscripts you have isn't really a relevant thing, even though that's what you're going to see in most classrooms around the United States uh, as well. So given that there are about 5,700 plus catalog manuscripts in the New Testament, the average of which is 350 pages long, that's over 2 million pages of handwritten text, grand total. So when you think about it, 1,500 to 2,000 meaningful and viable variants over 2 million pages of hand-copied text spanning approximately 1,500 years up to and really actually a little bit past the invention of printing because it took a while for printing to catch on, at least in the West, is an amazingly small percentage of the text reflecting an amazingly accurate history of transmission. One might say it is downright miraculous. Now, just to give you an idea of uh, how much variation there is, a few years ago I asked my computer to compare the two most dissimilar printed Greek texts. For those of you who know something about the background of this subject, this is a comparison of the Byzantine text type with the Alexandrian text type. And so when you compare them, I asked it to mark in green where differences were. So here's Ephesians chapter 1, and you'll see there's one here, one here, one there, 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 and one you can barely see right there, which is actually an important little textual variant at um, at Ephesians 1.14. Uh, whether it is has in regards to the Holy Spirit or ha, who is the down payment, the arabone of our inheritance. Uh, It's an important variant, but you'll notice it's it's a rather small one, just one letter difference between the two. But you can see that in the vast majority, there is no variation whatsoever in the transmission of this text, over 1,500 years of handwriting. Obviously, If the state of the New Testament was that, well, there were these people and they wrote this kind of New Testament and these people over here, they wrote theirs, there would be massive differences. Uh, You wouldn't even have Ephesians in some places or you'd have a completely different story or things like that. Clearly, that's not the case whatsoever. Now, 
Guess which book of the New Testament we have the fewest manuscripts of grand total? Which book do you think of the New Testament we have the fewest manuscripts of grand total? Somebody beat you to it. Book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. Uh, it has a very interesting transmission history, partly because it had to fight for so long for inclusion in the canon, which I think is a good thing. I think any book talking about multi-headed monsters should have to fight for inclusion in the canon. It shouldn't, do, you know, Christians shouldn't be going around, hey, anybody else got some more books with multi-headed monsters in it? We'd like to have a few more in the canon, you know. Uh, I'm glad that uh, there is an examination of these things. So you can see here, uh, there's a little bit more in the way of, uh, of uh, uh, words. But again, the vast majority of the text is identical all the way through. And we'll be looking at how you can uh, determine the original readings uh, a little bit uh, later on. One of them, for example, I am ta alpha chi ta omega. Uh, well, some manuscripts just have an alpha and didn't spell alpha out doesn't mean anything, but it's a variant, and you got to count it, and the computer goes, ah, difference, and marks it. Um, the Gospels are uh, very often copied, uh, and so you'd expect to have a little more variation there. So here's uh, Mark 1, 1 through 14. Um, here is uh, actually right here is a uh, interesting variant that was discussed at the University of Pretoria just uh, uh, a few weeks ago, one of the variants that came up. And uh, uh, you can see just a few places like that. Guess which book has the cleanest text, the, the least variation? It is the book of Hebrews. Um, I'm not sure if it's just because people didn't read it as much as they don't read it today either. I don't know. But uh, you'll notice there's only one, two, three places. And that's just an article there. It doesn't, uh, again, uh, amazingly uh, clear and uh, accurate transmission of the text over time. But even the 1,500 to 2,000 number needs to be understood. Even when the variant does impact the reading of the text, in the large majority of instances, the careful student of the text can see which reading is original. Many of these errors involve common scribal errors, mistakes that we continue to make to this very day when copying from one text to another, unless you happen to be copying by cut and paste, which is a wonderful way of doing things. But have you noticed you can even make mistakes there? Uh, sometimes you don't get the last few letters of the, of the word or something like that. Even cut and paste is not uh, always perfect, but it's uh, certainly you need to realize, especially you younger folks, uh, most of the rest of us lived our lives without something called cut and paste. In fact, uh, anybody out there ever write a term paper on an IBM Selectric? Oh, yeah, that was... That was now, young people, you need to understand, some of us have lived rougher lives than you have. Do you want to know how difficult it is to write a term paper on an IBM Selectric? Or even an earlier typewriter? We had things called correction tape. We had something called whiteout. Yes, whiteout. Great stuff. And the most frustrating thing was if you had to put footnotes into your paper. The computer couldn't do that for you because it wasn't a computer. You were the computer. You're sitting there. And you've got to remember to leave enough space on the paper to put the footnote in. But if you're typing along, you're doing a good job. This page is going well. There's not a bunch of corrections on it. You get to the end of the page, and all of a sudden you go, I forgot my footnote. And you know what you did? You took that piece of paper out. You crumbled it up. You threw it out. You put a new one in and started all over again. That was rough life, kids. Let me tell you something. All right? So when you've got your little computer that sticks that stuff in there on its own, look, you've, you've not lived uh, the kind of life we have. That's why you young people need to respect us old people. That's all there is to it. So <sighs> that doesn't go over very well anymore. But anyways, all right. Here's an example from the history of the New Testament itself. If you want to look at your Bible, uh, let me just real quick. How many King James is in the audience? Wow. One, two, three. Okay. How about New King James? One, two. All right. Uh, ESV? Ooh. <laughs> Someone at Crossways going, hallelujah. <laughs> How about uh, some New American Standards out there? All right. Okay, good. A few of the old folks there. All right. All right. Good. Okay. All right. Now, you need to understand... The King James and the New King James are based upon something called the Textus Receptus, and all the others are based upon the modern, uh, what's called an eclectic Greek text. So 
there's going to be a difference. The major textual differences between the King James and New King James have the same Greek text. And then NASB, ESV, Holman Christian, NIV, whatever, they all have uh, pretty much the same Greek text uh, that they're translating from. So if we compare 1 John 3, 1, in uh, King James it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called, oops, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Compare that with 1 John 3, 1, the NASB. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now, for those men in the audience who are colorblind, and there are a few in every audience, uh, we have marked off the variant with the red, and such we are. So here you have a difference between the King James and the New King James, and in the modern translations, I'm sorry, the King James and the uh, New American Standard, And in the modern translations, you have an affirmation of our adoption as sons of God. Now, if I wanted to, uh, you know, preach against the King James or something like that, uh, I might uh, start off talking about how well those Anglican translators, they didn't believe in the the adoption of uh, of us as as children of God, and so they took it out and all the rest of this stuff. And that's normally what King James translators do. Uh, King James only advocates, I'm sorry, do when uh, they talk about variations from the King James text. But the reality is, this is simply a glowing example of what's called homoi teluton. I want you young folks to quiz your parents today over lunch, uh, if they can remember this wonderful word, homoi teluton, which means similar endings. Similar endings. Think of how many times you've been copying a word. Again, if you aren't using copy-paste, you're actually copying out of a book, a newspaper, a journal article, or something like that. You're actually sitting there typing away. How many times have you been copying a word any with such combinations as I-N-G, T-I-O-N, E-S, common English endings of words, and when looking back at what you were copying, have mistakenly started with a different word that had the same ending. So in other words, you're typing along, you write the term, you see the term education, education, you look back, you see T-I-O-N, you continue on. Unfortunately, the T-I-O-N was on the next line down at the end of the word information, and you have now inadvertently deleted an entire line. You didn't intend to. Sometimes the sentence continues to make sense. Sometimes it doesn't. If you're not thinking, you might not even notice it. That kind of copying error is common amongst human beings. We are imperfect copiers. We were not made to be photocopiers, at least most of us weren't. And so uh, why is there a difference there? Well, there's all the information you could ever want to know uh, about why there's a difference there. Uh, In fact, this is a modern Greek text, and you'll see right here is the phrase chi esmen, and we are. There's a little square right there, and then a backslash right there. You find the square over here, and it tells you that that phrase is deleted by these manuscripts. And that's an important symbol right there. That's the capital, that's called the fraktur M. That means the majority text. The majority of the Greek manuscripts do not contain this phrase. They do not. But vast majority of scholars would say that this is an abs- basically a certainty that this was original. Why? Well, let's take a look at what it would have originally looked like. Ancient writers made the same kind of error that we did. Here is the relevant portion of the Greek as it would have appeared in the uncial or majuscule text in the early days of the New Testament. What you need to understand is that for the first 800 years of the transmission of the text of the New Testament, it was written in all capital letters no spaces between words, and almost no punctuation at all. Now think about that. It's just a long running line of letters. That's how they wrote documentary Greek until about 900 years after Christ when someone got the bright idea, hey, let's start breaking up, let's put some space between the the words, let's use capital forms and smaller letters and use more punctuation. And uh, that's the development of what's called minuscule text. So this is the relevant text, and so let's... uh, Let's use color once again to show us what happened. You can see right here, uh, you can see techna, children, theu, of God. We'll explain why that's spelled differently a little bit later on. Claythomen, that we might be called. Notice that it ends with what we would in English call M-E-N, mu, epsilon, nu. And we are, we are ends with mu, epsilon, nu. For this reason, the world goes on from there. So what you have are similar endings. Someone writes Claythomen, their eye comes back, and instead of seeing 
that MEN, they see this MEN, they continue on from there. There's an inadvertent uh, deletion of the phrase, and we are. Homoi tell you, Tom. So when you see that kind of thing, when you see that kind of, uh, oh, there's an ending very nearby, that's kind of a very common scribal error, then that has a, a great impact on how you analyze the manuscripts. But here, notice the problem. If we only had one manuscript of 1 John, and it was the first manuscript where someone made this error, how would we ever know? How would we ever know? And if, if the transmission of the text is one copy, one copy, one copy, one copy in a straight line, there's no way we could ever know what the original was. That's not how the New Testament was transmitted, however. We have many copies of First John. And as a result, even though this is the minority of them, you don't determine the text by taking, let's say we have uh, 400 manuscripts of First John. There are some people who say what you should do is you just count manuscripts. So if 300 of them read one way and 100 of them read one the other way, you just go with the 300. You don't even worry about the fact that the 100 are older, closer to the original than the 300 that come later on. There are some people who uh, present that idea. The vast majority of Christian scholars have rejected that, uh, that concept and don't go that direction. Now, the majority of those 5,700 plus Greek manuscripts date from after 1000 AD, comprising the, there's that Fraktur M, majority text. The earlier texts are called papyri text, written upon, written in unseal or majuscule text. There's a little bit of confusion because a, a papyri, you, you're just, you're just, you are describing the kind of material it's written on. Papyri was made by taking the leaves of papyrus plant, putting them at 90 degree angles, pressing them together. You could make a, a pretty durable and, and writable surface. Of course, nobody back then realized that, they, that some of these would be lasting for 1,800 years and become very important to us today. Um, uh, we, for example, today, I've, I've noticed, I look back at the books I bought in seminary, and the, the pages are yellowed, and they're getting brittle, and, and stuff like that. Uh, we don't really actually make good, high-quality paper very often anymore. Uh, we can, we know how to, but it's cheaper uh, to go the other direction. And uh, most of my books are going to look really bad 200 years from now, let alone 1,800 years from now. So the fact that we have almost anything uh, to look at these days is, is rather amazing. Majuscule text, all capital forms, no spacing, almost no punctuation, as we saw in 1 John 3.1. Here's a graphic that sort of shows you the general distribution by century of the New Testament manuscripts. And so uh, you can see here that the, the vast bulk are after 1000 AD. They're the minuscules. Uh, these are the Byzantine manuscripts. There's a reason for this historically when you think about it. I mean, by about 300, the Western uh, portion of the empire was primarily using Latin. Um, and then what happened between 632 and 732? I mentioned this yesterday. What happened? The rise of Islam, 632 to 732, the expansion of Islam. Islam takes over in the Holy Lands, all across North Africa, where there was a vibrant Christian community, up into Spain and, and, and Portugal, places like that. And so that's going to impact the production of, of manuscripts. And so the primary area where Greek is still being used is around Byzantium or Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. And so the vast majority of these manuscripts are produced in that area during that time. Uh, because that's where Greek was continuing to be utilized in that way. You can see here the papyri in blue, and then these green are called the unsealed texts. They're upon parchment, which is actually animal skin, but extremely uh, thin uh, uh, type of material. Now, I can tell you all these things, but what I like to do is show you. Uh, I've, I've found that a lot of believers like to be able to see what we're talking about, uh, because it's one thing to look at a Greek New Testament, and there's all these funny... Uh, symbols down at the bottom that represent this manuscript or that manuscript. But being able to see them uh, sort of gives you somewhat of a connection that, that generally people don't have, even though today, uh, your generation, our generation, the people alive today, have more information available to us than any other generation has ever had. Uh, no generation has been able to see the New Testament manuscripts that you are able to see, that you're able to go online and see, that you're able to purchase Accordance or Logos or Bible Works or whatever program you use. Uh, we, we now have access to material that just simply has never been known uh, in one place uh, in, any, in any generation before ours. It's, it's an amazing thing. So let's start. There's the same manuscript I showed you before, P52. I was, uh, I was trying to get uh, the, this is called the recto side. 
I was trying to get the Verso side. I still don't, I've never seen my computer go, no, I will not import this graphic. I, it's like, why? Um, but I was trying to get the other side uh, up there for you uh, so you could see it as well. It's written on both sides. Uh, this is called Ryland's 4 to 7 or manuscript P52. Now, P52 is uh, agreed by the vast majority of scholarship to be the earliest fragment of the New Testament that we possess. Now, there are, you will find some scholars who would argue for one other manuscript or one over here that might be a little bit older or at least uh, contemporary uh, with this particular, uh, this particular fragment. It's about the size of a credit card. Uh, it's two and a half by three and a half inches. Um, it's, it's just that small. Uh, it was discovered in the middle 18, uh, 1930s. Uh, back in the olden days, the British basically stole everybody else's treasures, took them to London. And uh, so uh, uh, a, a scholar was thumbing through uh, these uh, uncatalogued papyrus fragments, and he recognized something. He recognized, he started translating it and realized uh, that uh, these were words from the New Testament. And uh, so uh, the papyri was sent to uh, four of the, uh, the leading papyrologists of the day. Uh, three of the four agreed on a range uh, right around 125 AD or as early as 100. Uh, you, now, how do you date that something like that? Well, it's based on the form of writing. Uh, this, is, this is called a Hadrianic script uh, that was popular during the uh, Emperor Hadrian's day, maybe a little bit earlier than that. And uh, one actually said it was before that, that is as early as the 90s. Now, that's incredibly, incredibly early, uh, amazingly early. And what's really neat about this papyrus, and, and today, by the way, we have fonts that match these things. So this is sort of how the text would have uh, wrapped around this particular little fragment here. There we go. Uh, we can match the, uh, the font. You can sort of see how it would have, uh, it would have fit. And uh, uh, this particular uh, text is from the Gospel of John. Now, why is that relevant? Well, if you had gone to seminary in Germany in the 1870s, uh, you would have been confidently told that John was written around 170 A.D. Why? Uh, well, because it has such a high view of Jesus. And the German rational critics had decided that since it has such a high view of Jesus, uh, then obviously it must uh, have developed much later because we know Jesus wasn't like that, see. And then long comes in 1930, uh, 1933, 34, uh, the discovery of this little papyri that comes long before when the German skeptical critics were saying John could have even been written uh, probably within 20 years of the actual writing of uh, the Gospel of John itself. And so here's one of those wonderful places where an actual uh, fact from history, a, a documentable piece of history itself, ends up destroying the, uh, the theories of the, the scholars. Now, most of you have already uh, found out that I am a geek. And uh, so uh, here is a, uh, a couple shots from my debate with Bart Ehrman. And uh, you will notice the tie that I am wearing here is made of P-52. Uh, not the real one. I didn't steal it and turn it into a tie. Uh, but I actually blew it up, and it's fully readable. Both sides uh, are what's on my tie there. And there I'm giving Dr. Ehrman his own copy of my P-52 tie. And that is one of the few times he actually smiled during the debate. So um, I, uh, I don't know what he's uh, done with it. I don't know if he burned it. I don't know if he wears it once in a while just to mock fundamentalists or something like that. I have no earthly idea, but uh, there is uh, my, my geeky P-52 tie, which I did not bring with me. Uh, it is available on Zazzle for those of you who are looking for wonderful Christmas gifts for your geeky friends. Uh, so you can look that up. Now, this is a fragment that I always am very, 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 very careful about talking about in a church. If you have any interpretational questions about what this fragment means, ask the big guy, okay? Not me. I leave it up to the leadership. Go to the elders. Ask them. Not me. Why do I say this? Because it touches on eschatology. And I don't discuss that subject. I don't debate that subject because I've found that most Christians who do are crazy. Okay? So, 
Uh, this is uh, a fragment of one of the, we only really have like two meaningful papyrus copies of the book of Revelation. Now, simple question, everybody. What's the number of the beast? Six, six, six. Okay. We could probably stop some biker going by on the freeway out there and go, what's the number of the beast? And he'll go, it's six, six, six right there. You know? You know? I mean, everybody knows the number of the beast, right? I mean, wow. You know, that's, that's easy. Except um, when you look at the two earliest manuscripts we have of that section in Revelation chapter 13. And here's that very section. And the two earliest manuscripts of the book of Revelation don't say 666. They say 616. Don't tell Tim LaHaye. (laughs) Ruin his day. Really ruin his day. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. Um, I think Dan Wallace has a really good suggestion, though. And I, I've got to give, give Dan uh, all the props for coming up with this. I, he put a lot of thought into it. And he, he went through it. And his suggestion is that 666 is the number of the beast, but 616 is the number of the neighbor of the beast. I have to just stop and let people think that one through a little bit. And they go, six. Oh, address. I get it. Okay, yeah. That's as far as I'm going to get. Uh, ask uh, other people uh, if you have any more questions about that. This is manuscript P- P72 from around AD 175 to 200. Um, I got to see this exact page in 1993 uh, when I was debating Jerry Matatix uh, during the papal visit to Denver, Colorado. This was on display in the Papal Treasures exhibit. Uh, I almost got myself into a lot of trouble uh, because while everybody else was looking at the tiaras and the diamonds and stuff like that, I didn't care anything about that stuff. This is right at the beginning of the display. It's in this, this case, and I'm drooling on the case. You know, I'm, I'm standing there, and I'm translating it, and my friend Rich is with me, and people would come up, and they'd, they'd look at it, and they'd read the description, and they'd look over at Rich, and, and they'd notice I was ignoring them, and they'd go, can he read that? And Richard would go, yeah, he can. Look at this, Bernie. This man can read this ancient papyri. And people start gathering around, you know, and, and uh, the, the, the security people. Are, so Richard dragged me off to go look at a crown for a while, and then I'd come back, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm looking at it. And one of the things I want you to see about it is you see these lines, like that line right there. There's one there, 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 there. These are what are called the nomina sacra. No one knows why Christians did this. There are theories galore, but none of them really make a whole lot of sense. But Christians developed a system of abbreviating key words in the New Testament. God, Lord, Jesus, Spirit. They would, they would abbreviate them. We don't know why. It wasn't just to, to, to take up less space, because you can tell if they wanted more space, there was space right there. This is the end of 1 Peter, and this is the beginning of 2 Peter. P72 is our earliest copy of 1 2 Peter and Jude. So it wasn't a space issue. We just don't know why they did it, but it marks off Christian manuscripts, because only Christians did it. Only Christians did it. Now, did any of you have the misfortune of reading The Da Vinci Code? Anybody see, did anybody see the movie? It, there, there was a while when I was traveling, man, at every gate I was at, everybody getting on the plane was reading the Da Vinci Code. I mean, that guy made some big bucks off that book. And if you know what the theory was, basically the theory was uh, that um, Constantine made up the deity of Christ. And at 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea, he comes along and, and he gets rid of all the old uh, manuscripts and he writes new gospels and he turns Jesus into a god, um, which is massively absurd on any level, but it was a work of fiction. Unfortunately, some people didn't notice it was in the fiction section, uh, but it is a work of fiction. But what I love about P70, P72 and others, let's, uh, let's sort of blow something up here. Right there is one of the earliest documented ex- examples of what's called a Granville Sharp construction. And if you know 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, it refers to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so there you have in the Greek language by a manuscript that was written uh, 150 years before Constantine came along, 
the belief in the deity of Christ, so he didn't make it up, he didn't insert it, he couldn't have gotten hold of all these manuscripts and made editorial changes or anything else. Very clearly, the, the doctrine of the deity of Christ, it's a part of the text of the New Testament and long pre-existed anything that Constantine ever dreamed of doing. Here is another very important Gospels manuscript. This is P75. Uh, P75 contains Luke and John. It probably initially uh, included Matthew and Mark as well. Uh, but remember, these are made of papyri. You can sort of see how the papyri splits and breaks when it becomes old and brittle and things like that. Uh, this is actually the beginning of John 1. There's John 1, 1 right there, the end of Luke, the beginning of John. Uh, and uh, it does at least indicate that this early on, uh, Luke and John were in that order, similar to the same order that we have today. And I really like this picture because this is P66, around the same time frame, right toward the end of that century. And what I like about this one is instead of just seeing the individual piece, you see the whole book. And you can see how papyri as a book, you see how the, the damage is lower outside corner and upper corner. So it almost always presents this kind of uh, shape right here because the binding is going to be pretty strong. It's going gonna, it's gonna to survive pretty well. So it's outside corner. Same thing happens with your own Bible. If you look at your Bible right now, where mo- most of the scratches and nicks on your, uh, uh, on your, uh, the gold or silver on the edge of your pages, same spots, uh, because that's where it's most likely to, uh, to get hit and uh, to get damaged. Uh, this also is from John 1.1. Here's further example of the fact that uh, Dan Brown made a lot of money off of silly people. Uh, this is John 1.1, and you can see that famous phrase, kai theos ain halagos, and the word was God, again, written long before uh, Constantine ever came along and um, uh, the deity of Christ found there. Now, here's one where I'm going to take a poll. Now, I'm going to tell you all ahead of time that most of the time when I take this poll of an audience, at least a third of the audience does not vote. And I find this disrespectful and unkind. Okay, I'm laying it out in front of you right now. No one's taking pictures of you. No one's going to mock you if you get it wrong. Vote, okay? Make a difference in this world, all right? Now, this is manuscript P46. P46 is the, the earliest collection we have. Well, let's just blow this up here. Pros Philippasius to the Philippians. So what is it? It is Paul's epistles. It's Paul's epistles all gathered in one place. This is the earliest manuscript we have of the Pauline epistles. Now, here's the question. What one book of the New Testament do we not know who wrote it? Hebrews, right. And there are people who think Paul wrote it or Apollos wrote it or or uh, Paul preached it in Hebrew and then Luke translated it into Greek. And uh, there's all sorts of different uh, theories uh, uh, it's been well said, God knows who wrote Hebrews, and that's the best uh, answer you can come up with. But here's the question that you all get to vote on. Do you think Hebrews is in P46? Do you think that back around the year 175 to 200, that whoever put this together put Hebrews in this manuscript or didn't put Hebrews in this manuscript? All right? There's our, there's our question. How many think that P46 contains Hebrews? How many think it does not contain Hebrews? How many of you didn't vote anyways? See? Okay. There's still some people, despite my putting my heart out there in front of you, still trampled on it and would not vote. Actually, most of you did. And most of you were right. It does contain the book of Hebrews. In fact, it comes right after Romans. So what does that tell you? Tells you that somebody early on thought that Paul wrote Hebrews. That's, that's all it tells you. It doesn't actually mean anything other than that, but there you go. Uh, now, I got to see this manuscript. This manuscript is in the Chester Beatty collection in Dublin, uh, Ireland. And I've got to tell you this story, even though my time's going by really quickly. I saw this very page. This very page is sitting right there in front of me. The problem was they keep it in very, very subdued light, obviously, because you, you don't want it to be in a bright light, which would cause it to, to fade over time and stuff like that. And we were, we were trying to read it, but it was just so dim. And then I got the idea that, well, the light's coming down from above in the display case. So where is it going to be the brightest? We're, well, we're reflecting off at the same angle. 
So what we did is we, we got down on our hands and knees and we're, we're doing this number looking up at the papyri and of course there are cameras for the security folks. And so they show up and they're sort of looking at us like, what are you doing? You know, I can just see them probably going, oh great, the Christians are worshiping the papyri again. Oh man. <laughs> uh, you know, so what are you doing? Well, we're reading them. We're translating them. You're translating them? Yeah, yeah. See, look right here. And so we started showing them stuff and they're like, Wow, most of the folks don't really take that much interest in these particular things, but we sure did. And uh, the one thing that bummed me out is I really wanted to see the Carmen Christi, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. The very page it contains it was there, but backwards. They had the other side showing. And I'm like, no! But um, sort of like when Darth Vader, no! (laughs) You liked that one, didn't you? Good. Okay, now, as I said, I'm a total geek, and uh, here's a picture of me. Uh, this is back, I think, in 08, 09, somewhere around there. I forget when it, exactly it was. On my first trip down to Australia, I had like half a day, and uh, they, my host said, so what do you want to do? You know, you want to go see the, the bridge, go see the opera house, you know, all the stuff you do in Sydney, you know, to, to do the... I mean, my, my wife went down with me. She actually went over the top of the bridge. You had to wear this thing, and you do this climbing stuff, and I'm afraid of heights, so I'm not doing that. Uh, but uh, what, what did I want to do when I went to Sydney? Well, I realized that there was a biblical manuscript, an ancient papyri fragment at Macquarie State University. And so we arranged to meet with the curator. There I am holding P91. That's the entirety of P91 right there. Actually, P91 is in, is in two pieces. The other two-thirds are in Milan, Italy, and they can't work with each other as to getting, putting them all back together again, uh, which would be nice. This is from Acts chapter 2, and uh, we put it under a microscope, and we examined the paleography and uh, the curator. Let me just put it this way. I have a feeling the curator's wife got tired of talking about paleography about 40 years earlier, because he seemed really excited to have an opportunity of talking about the formation of olives and stuff like that with someone who actually showed interest in it, and so we had a great time. But there's, uh, there's P91 from around 250 from the book of Acts uh, down in uh, Sydney, Australia. Now, after the peace of the church in A.D. 313, Christians could have professional scribes copy the scriptures. At this time, the great vellum or leather manuscripts began to appear, including the three greatest of these, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Alexandrinus. Sinaiticus of Vaticanus may be uh, among the Bibles copied with imperial monies at the time of the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325. Uh, we are told from historical sources that Constantine gave money to the church for the copying of Bibles. Why? Did he tell them what to copy? No. But the Roman church had been, the Roman state, I'm sorry, had been destroying Bibles for a very long period of time at that point in time. And so it was to replace some of those that had been destroyed. Now here is a picture of, uh, of Sinaiticus. Uh, this is very much as I saw it in 2005 at the British Library. Just walked in, there was Sinaiticus, right next to it was Codex Vaticanus, behind me was a Tyndale Bible and a 1611 King James. Pretty amazing. But let's blow it up so you can see what Sinaiticus looks like. That is not printed, my friends, that is written. Uh, notice the amazing regularity, the beauty of the hand. Uh, you can also see there, there's been some insertions here, there's a insertion there, a marginal note there, something in between the lines here. Um, This uh, manuscript has been greatly vilified. In fact, interestingly enough, uh, in uh, December uh, of this year, I'll be doing a debate uh, with a man who has produced a documentary. Chris Pinto is his name. Uh, And uh, he is promoting the theory that this is a forgery, uh, that it was actually written by a 19-year-old Greek man in 1839. Uh, and that it's part of a great Jesuit conspiracy, uh, along with Codex Vaticanus and all of the papyri. Uh, It's all a Jesuit conspiracy, and we're going to be debating that. Uh, The reality is this is from around 325 to 350. Uh, So when uh, it was discovered, it had been in use for about 1,500 years. It was discovered by a man by the name of Konstantin von Tischendorf. Uh, Von Tischendorf was a German Uh, but he believed in the New Testament, and in fact, uh, he was looking for a a manuscript like Sinaiticus to defend the veracity of the New Testament. He wrote a book that's still relevant to this day on the dating of the Gospels, excellent argumentation against the German liberal criticism of his day, 
And so it's sad to see Tischendorf being attacked so vociferously by King James only folks today. Here is where it was found, the monastery of St. Catherine's at the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, and uh, the story of its discovery is, uh, remains controversial to this day. Uh, I just would direct you to the debate coming up for a rather full rendition of those things. We don't have time to get into it this morning uh, as we only have about 20 minutes left. Uh, but uh, you can see all of Codex Sinaiticus at codexsinaiticus.org. They actually provide you with uh, both a uh, direct on light, the, the, uh, the, the top version here, and then a raking light so you can actually see the surface of the, of the, papa, of the uh, manuscript itself. Uh, it's, and you can zoom in and uh, super high quality, excellent, excellent website. It's only been up for a few years now, but all of Codex Sinaiticus is available to us now in that form. Another of the major unseals is uh, Codex Vaticanus, uh, which is from around the same time as Sinaiticus. We don't have as much access to it because it's in the Vatican Library. And unfortunately, sometime in the 1400s, uh, someone came along and said, you know, this has faded a lot, and they retraced everything in the book in the 1400s, uh, which uh, isn't good, uh, obviously. You want to be able to see what was originally written a little bit more clearly. But they did a good job retracing it. They, they weren't trying to make much in the way of changes to it. So it's still a very important uh, manuscript. And then here's Codex Alexandrinus from around A.D. 400. Uh, I've also made a really cool tie out of that, which I don't have time to tell you about, but it's sort of fun. We'll talk about it some other time. Now, aside from the 5,700-plus Greek text, we have early translations in the Latin, Coptic, Sahidic, etc., Boharic, that are important witnesses to the early text of the New Testament. Combining these, the Greek text yields over 20,000 handwritten witnesses to the New Testament. We have more than 124 Greek manuscript witnesses within the first 300 years after the writing of the New Testament, far more than any other work of antiquity. In fact, we have 12 manuscripts from the 2nd century, that is within 100 years of the writing of the New Testament. Those manuscripts contain portions of all four Gospels, nine books of Paul, Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation, comprising a majority of the books of the New Testament we possess today. Again, no work of antiquity even comes close to this early attestation at all. Now, in fact, when you think about it, the average length of time between the writing of most works contemporaneous with the New Testament such as the historical works of Pliny, Suetonius, Tacitus, and their first extant copies is between 500 and 900 years. In other words, you take other works that were being written around the time of the New Testament, and the average amount of time between when it was written and our first copies is between half a millennium and a millennium. Compare that with the New Testament where we have fragments that come within 100 years of the writing of the New Testament. Now, this is where I'm going to have, uh, Mr. Soundman, a very brief uh, audio portion. This is a question that I asked Bart Ehrman, again, the leading critic of uh, New Testament Christianity today. This is a question that I asked him in regards to a statement he had made on the unbelievable radio uh, program about the dating of the manuscripts. Listen very carefully to what the leading critic of the New Testament says right at the end of this clip. On the unbelievable radio program in London, you discuss the length of time that exists between the writing of Paul's letter to the Galatians and the first extant copy, that being 150 years. Uh, you describe this time period as enormous. That's a quote. Could you tell us what term you would use to describe the time period between, say, the original writings of Suetonius or Tacitus or Pliny and their first extant manuscript copies? Very enormous. Sorry, ginormous would be a good one? Ginormous. Ginormous, okay. Yeah. Uh, Gi- I mean, ginormous doesn't cover it. Uh, <laughs> the New Testament, we have much earlier uh, attestation than for any other book from antiquity. Did you catch that? For the New Testament, we have much earlier attestation than for any other book of antiquity. And he's the leading critic of the New Testament uh, in the English speaking world today. To give you an illustration, this is a graphic produced by a fellow down in Australia. Uh, the center dot is point of origin, and then the distance away from the center of the dot is the distance between the time of its original writing and the first copies we have of any particular work. So, for example, this right here is the work of Homer. We have 643 manuscripts of Homer, and the earliest manuscripts are from 500 years after the original writing. Here is uh, Sophocles out here, 193 manuscripts. But the problem is there's 1,400 years between when it was written 
and the first copies we have. Poor Plato out here. We only have seven manuscripts, and unfortunately, there's a 1,200-year gap between the original writing and the copies that we have. The big old thing on the, uh, this side is not the sun. That's called the New Testament, okay? Uh, that just gives you a graphical idea of how many manuscripts we have for the New Testament. This includes, of course, Latin and the other translations. Uh, and how close those manuscripts come to the original time in which it was written, the first manuscripts that we have, in comparison to any other work of antiquity. So to question that we can figure out what the New Testament originally said, in essence requires you to say that there's nothing that we can know about antiquity at all. There's nothing we can know about what happened in, in the past because all historical documents would be utterly irrelevant at that particular point in time. Now, Often the transmission of the text of the New Testament is likened to the phone game we played as kids. Some people call it Chinese whispers, where one person whispers something in the ear of the person next in line and so forth around the circle until the last person repeats what he has heard, and it is inevitably changed in often humorous ways from what was originally said. But is this an accurate way of thinking of how the New Testament was transmitted over time? The initial gospels and epistles of the New Testament, by the way, I made this graphic so any oohs and ahs will be appreciated. The initial gospels and epistles of the New Testament are written at various places at various times. Some were written for distribution within the community, such as the Gospels, and others were epistles sent to specific locations. Then copies would be made and sent elsewhere. Often Christians traveling from one place to another would encounter a book they had not heard of before, and hence would make a copy and bring back to their own fellowship. And though a graphic that would represent how many different lines of transmission there were and how often they were interconnected would rapidly become useless due to the number of manuscripts that would be on the screen, the fact of that complex, his, complex history of transmission should be kept in mind. Over time, single books would be gathered into collections. This was especially true of the Gospels and the Epistles of Paul. Hence, we have P75 and P66, Gospel Collections. P46 contained the Epistles of Paul, all dating from the middle to the end of the second century. These collections would then come together until finally, after the peace of the church in AD 313, you could have entire copies of the scriptures, such as we find in Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. But the important point to note is the multifocality of this process. Multiple authors writing at multiple times to multiple audiences produced a text that appears in history already displaying multiple lines of transmission. This results in the textual variance we must study, but it also illustrates something else that's very important. It is very important to realize the transmission of the text of the New Testament did not follow a phone game single line. Not only are the written documents less liable to corruption than what is whispered in the ear, but the phone game involves a single line of transmission. The New Testament originated in multiple places written by multiple authors with books being sent to multiple locations. This multifocality leads us to the final considerations that demonstrate the bankruptcy of the modern attacks upon the New Testament. To make specific changes in a text, like the New Testament, which originally circulated as a group of texts, not as a single body, would require a centralized controlling body that could make wholesale changes in these widely dispersed texts. But the fact of the matter is, no such central agency ever existed or could have existed. Christianity was a persecuted religion made up mainly of the lower classes. There was no central authority that could ever have gathered up all the texts and made wholesale changes. Such was impossible in the earliest days of transmission, and given that we have such ancient texts now, obviously could not have happened at a later point without giving clear evidence. In fact, we can prove beyond all doubt this kind of corruption did not take place, since papyri have been found that date back to the second century, and that only within the past hundred years. Had any later centralized organization sought to alter the text, those later texts would show stark differences as older and older manuscripts are found. But just the opposite, in fact, has been the case. So all allegations of purposeful corruption, such as those made by Muslims, or by New Agers, for that matter, fall upon the mere consideration of the historical context and the data itself. The rapid, widespread distribution of the New Testament manuscripts in the first two centuries precludes any purposeful centralized corruption. It also gives rise to the need to study the relatively small number of textual variants that we have today. But this leads to another important point. When scribes copied their texts, they were very conservative, often incorporating marginal notes into the text since they could not be sure if the note was original or not. So in other words, if you're, trans, you're, you're copying someone's manuscript and there's something written in the margin, what are you going to do with that? Very often you can't go back and ask the original writer, what did, did you, was that supposed to be in the text or not? Is this something you're commenting on or not? 
And so what they would do is they'd incorporate it. That's why the later manuscripts are longer than the earlier manuscripts. They would incorporate. They would keep those readings in it. That's what happened, for example, John 5.4. John 5.4 undoubtedly was a marginal note that was explaining why it was there were people lying around the pool of Bethesda waiting to get in because of the angel coming down and troubling the waters. There was an explanation given. It was written in a margin. Someone else then included that marginal note into the text itself, and that's where the verse came from. But since the King James was translated from the later Byzantine manuscripts, a verse number is assigned to it. When you remove it, now you skip the verse number, and it looks like something was quote-unquote taken out, when in reality what has happened is you've recognized something that was inadvertently inserted. But it's important to recognize that they even preserved mistakes or silly readings. This may sound bad at first, but consider what it really means. The New Testament text is tenacious. That means readings are preserved in the text. All readings, including the original readings, are still a part of the manuscript tradition. This is extremely important for you to understand. And I'm basically out of time, but because I think I've got uh, four, about five minutes. Okay. This is really the key issue. This is what you need to understand. The original readings are still there. There's an excellent illustration that Rob Bowman came up with. I wish I had come up with it, but he came up with it first. He says, it's like you have a 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle, but you have 10,100 pieces. Now, what's better, to have 10,100 pieces or to have 9,900 pieces? It's much better to have 10,100 pieces because then you have extra that has accrued over time, marginal notes, expansions of titles, things like that. But have you ever made a big jigsaw puzzle? You got to the end and found out that the cat ate one of the pieces? It's a terrible thing. And when you're talking about the Word of God, you don't want to be missing anything. So that's, I think, a very good illustration of what we're dealing with when we're looking at the New Testament manuscripts. That is why the believing textual critic can persevere in even the most difficult variants. One of the readings is the original. Now, very, very quickly, a key theological example, and then I'm done. 1 Timothy 3.16 Compare the King James Version and the New American Standard. King James says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. A common confession, great is the mystery of godliness, New American Standard. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, etc., etc. The difference between God and he who. Now, God and he who look like they're very, very different Words. This is one of the key texts that King James only has used to say that modern translation is trying to deny the deity of Christ, etc., etc. This variant is very evenly matched as far as external evidence is concerned. There is the external evidence. Don't have time to go through it. But remember, these variations arose when the New Testament was written in majuscule text, all capital forms. So let's take a look at what that would have looked like. The top is God. The bottom is he who. Everyone clear? Okay, let's move on. No. Let's use some color to see what the difference between the two readings would be. And now let's blow it up so you can see the difference between God and he who. Not much of a difference, is there? In fact, remember what you're writing on is papyri. And what does papyri have in it? It has lines. There's actually two small line differences between the os, because that's a nomina sacra, the abbreviation of the word God, and hos, which means he who. In fact, what you've got here is Sinaiticus, And you can see the original very clearly was Haas. And then many, many centuries later, someone has put in three little dots and in a much later hand written in Theos uh, as uh, the variant reading there as a correction. But the original was obviously he who was manifest in the flesh. Now, very quickly, I'll just jump down to the conclusion here uh, because we are out of time. And in summary then, 400,000 variants, yes, 99% of them inconsequential to the meaning of the text. Most thoroughly and earliest documented work of antiquity spread all over the world very quickly. There was no controlling authority that could edit, insert, take out, so on and so forth. And any later editing would stand out clearly in comparison with the ancient manuscripts that we now have in our possession. Now, that was pretty fast. Uh, You might say, where can I get more information on this? Well, my book on the King James Only Controversy obviously goes into the vast majority of this information because I had to explain where the New Testament came from to explain why the King James position is is untenable. Uh, Unfortunately, most books on this subject are not the easiest to read, not overly exciting, uh, but the information is certainly out there. Many of them are now available in electronic form for your various programs, whether you have Accordance, Logos, Bible Works, whatever 
uh, Bible programs you might have. Uh, many of the, uh, the excellent works on these subjects are available. Uh, many of those, man, those programs now will allow you to have a critical edition of the Greek New Testament. You can just click on the manuscript. It'll tell you when it was written, where it's housed, everything right there in front of you. Uh, like I said, I've got all that on my iPad now. I've got all that on my phone now. Uh, so no generation before ours has uh, ever had this level of information available to them. So I know that's awfully quick, but hopefully it gives you an idea of just how rich the amount of information available to us is. And so young people, when you start running into folks saying, you know, the Bible's been changed, you don't know what it originally said, uh, realize the answers are there. It might take a little work to track down the information, but the answers are there. We have truly a gift given to us in the preservation of the text of the Scriptures. Thank you very much for your attention.